Did I just hear a bell ring? Must be time for HTM school. Hi, I'm Matt Taylor from Numenta, and welcome to another episode of HTM School. Today we're going to talk about sparse distributed representation, overlap sets, and subsampling. But first, a little aside, because I want to talk about the neuron and how neurons are related to SDRs, how they process SDRs. So let's look at SDRs from a neuron standpoint. Here is a pyramidal neuron in the neocortex. This neuron is a complex pattern recognition system, and it's receiving a constant stream of SDRs. It's getting SDRs from its apical dendrites, which are receiving feedback from higher levels in the hierarchy. Those represent connections to cells up at a higher level. It's receiving SDRs from basal dendrites that are like contextual SDRs coming from cells in the same region of the hierarchy. And it's also receiving SDR input from proximal dendrites. These are coming from lower levels of the hierarchy. They're direct connections to cells there or from sensory input. So every one of these pyramidal cells is constantly receiving a stream of lots of different SDRs through its different dendrites. And all it's doing is trying to decide when it's going to fire. When it fires, it plays a role in all of the thousands of other SDRs where it's represented by turning its bit on. That's how it plays its part in all of these other SDRs that other neurons are looking for patterns in. So there's two different ways to look at this. From the pyramidal neuron standpoint, it's observing all of these different SDRs and deciding when it fires, each of those representing different cells that it's connected to. And it also plays a part in all of these other SDRs that other neurons are observing by firing and turning its bit on whenever it does its job of recognizing these complex patterns. So as we talk about today's lesson and we look at all the SDRs we're gonna look at today, keep that in mind that every bit in these represents some type of neuron or neural activity and that's how your brain processes information. So let's take a look at overlap sets. You can think about an overlap set for a specific SDR like this. Given any SDR, let's call the SDR X, given any SDR that has an N and a W, the overlap set is the number of SDRs total that have the same N and a specific W with a specific number of bits of overlap with X. So in this case, this N is coming from here. This W is coming from this slider. And this 40 bits of overlap is coming from this B, which is how many bits do we require for the overlap. In this case, you can see there is only one. For this specific SDRX, how many different ways can these bits fit into these specific spots? And there's only one way. So we have this formula here, which gives us the length of the overlap set, the size. So let's dig into this formula a little bit and try and make it intuitive. So what we have here is we've split this formula up into products. This is the product of these two terms. The left term is in this box on the left, and we are multiplying it by the right term, which is in this box on the right. And the way to think about this is, the left side is the on bit space, the right side is the off bit space for this SDR. And in this case we have right now, without touching any of these sliders, 40 on bits can fit in only one way in 40 spaces. That's what this is telling us. 40 on bits, 40 spaces, one way. That's basically WX choose B, and then remember in a previous episode when we talked about the capacity of an SDR, this is a capacity formula. There's only one way that these can fit. Similarly, on the right-hand side, we're talking about all the off bits. You might notice 560 is 600 minus 40, right? So these are just representing all of the different off bits that are in this SDR. And how many different ways zero on bits can fit there? Well, only one. Right? So 1 times 1 equals 1. Now we're going to make this a little more interesting. I'm going to require not that every single bit matches, 
but I'm going to move this down one to 39. So now I'm saying, what's the overlap set for this SDR where I'm requiring 39 bits of overlap, not 40? So it's no longer one. It's 22,400. And this is because one of these bits now is gone. So in the on bit space, there's one bit missing. There's 40 different ways to arrange that missing bit because there's 40 different spaces. Similarly, on the other side, we've moved that bit. We've taken it out. We're saying we don't require that bit to be on anymore, but it has to be somewhere. It has to be in this empty bit space somewhere. In this 560 bit space, there are 500 different places it can be. So the overlap set cardinality is the product of how many ways the on bits can fit in the on space times how many ways those extra bits can fit in the off bit space. So I hope that makes this a little bit more intuitive. And it's interesting to see as we slide this B number down and require less and less bits for a match, you can see all these bits in the on space not being required anymore jumping over into the off bit space. And there's a lot more places those can fit over here. So you're going to see this number, the right hand product, increase very rapidly, much more rapidly than the left hand product as we move this B down, right? And the overall overlap set cardinality, which is here, goes up very quickly. As we move it up, we require more bits. There's less and less SDRs that will fit in that space. As we move it down, there's more and more. The chance of a false positive can also be calculated. It is basically the cardinality of the overlap set divided by the uniqueness of the original SDR. Uh, so this is pretty low in this case. And as we move B up, it's going to get lower and lower. And as the overlap set gets lower and lower too. So the chance of a false positive will go up as the amount of SDRs in the overlap set goes up because there's more of a chance of some random collision. So a quick jump to a, a bigger example, 2048 bits. If we were to require a perfect match where B is 40 and W is 40, um, again, there's only one SDR that will fit in this space. So let's dial this down to something more realistic, maybe uh, three fourths of the total on bit. So if we require three fourths of the total on bits to uh, match in the overlap score, then we have a chance of false positive here that is extremely low. So this shows that the resilience of, of the SDRs here. Um, as we increase N in an SDR, the capacity of the SDR goes up so quickly that the space is so large, there is an almost astronomically small chance of any false positive occurring. So we can be pretty certain that if we get a match and if we're comparing an SDR to something in an overlap set and we get a match that it's a, it's a real match, it's not uh, uh, just some random match. So now let's talk a bit about subsampling. Um, in a previous episode, we talked about how we could compress SDRs because they are sparse. They can be compressed simply by saving the indices of the on bits. Uh, we don't have to serialize the entire array of ones and zeros. We can just save those integer values representing the indices, which compresses it quite a bit. It turns out that SDRs are so fault tolerant that you don't even have to save all of those indices. You can just take a sample of them. You can take a percentage of those indices and save them. And when you want to match incoming SDRs to that subsample, it's still really accurate. So let's take an example of this. Here we have an uh, original SDR X. It has an N of 1024, a W of eight, very low sparsity. And I'm calling the subsampled version of this X prime. Okay, so these are the, this is sort of the original SDR. The subsampled version only has four bits on. As you can see, some of these bits have been randomly removed uh, as a part of the sampling process. So all of these bits in X prime exist in X, but half of them don't, half of them are removed. So now we take some random SDR Y that has the same dimensionality as the original SDR, and we want to match it and see if we can tell 
is this the original SDR or not, based on a subsample of that original SDR. Uh, so this is just a random SDR, um, and I've got a button here that just tries other random SDRs, so you can kind of see when we do the comparison, and here's the comparison we're going to compare X prime, the subsampled version of X, to Y, and it'll tell us uh, what's the overlap score and, and show both of the bits in one place. And as you can see, as I'm cycling through this, there's the overlap score has been zero, there is one. So it's very, uh, very low chance of there being a collision in this case. And if you do the math, the chance of a false positive here with these parameters right now is about three in 10,000. So I could sit here and click this button all day long and only get an overlap score um, that justifies a match. In this case, our theta is two, right? So uh, out of these eight bits, two of them must overlap with uh, these bits in the subsample, right? Out of those random eight bits. And it's barely ever gonna happen. Um, if we move this up and require four bits, the chance of false positive goes way down. If we require just one bit or one bit, you know, it's um, three in a hundred or so. So you could probably see uh, this happen if I continue to click this. So let's go to an even larger example. So here we have an SDR of over 2,000 bits, 40 of which are on. So this is a typical HTM uh, dimensionality for SDRs. We're just subsampling again half of them. So we're gonna we're gonna store 20 bits in this X prime, and uh, now we can see our chance of false positive has gone even further down, um, as as you can see here. So there's really little chance as I try a bunch of random uh, Y SDRs here that there's going to be an overlap of over 10 in in this. So this shows you sort of the resilience to faults if if somehow. Um, we, if we don't store all of those on bits when we're, when we're storing SDRs for comparison, we don't have to. Um, it's still very resilient to noise. So hopefully you come away from this episode understanding that the way we use SDRs with HTM systems, um, they are extremely tolerant to noise because of the massive capacity of SDRs. We can, we can tune them in a way that they are really tolerant to false positives because of the input space being so large. And that they're also tolerant to faults. In this example of subsampling, we've turned half of the bits off entirely, and we can still pretty reliably match incoming SDRs just to the subsample to decide whether it is the original SDR or not, with a very low chance of false positives there as well. So in the next episode, we're going to talk about SDR classification and unions, and that's going to go even deeper. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please click subscribe if you haven't subscribed to our channel and you like this series, and click that thumbs up button down there. It encourages me to continue producing these videos. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next episode. it plays a role in. Now, <clears throat> for other neurons that are also listening to hundreds of other, uh, this is gonna be interesting. First of all, the B is how many bits must, be. so we can, we can change. I don't know if I wanna to touch that. Which sort of makes sense if you think about it because in, in this case, in this case, there's only one way for these bits to fit in this space. That makes sense. Um, divided by inches W of something else that I forgot. Mm, yeah, cardinality view over set. So interest uh, uh, with the same end value, but and this. <clears throat> so I've showed you in this episode that how. <clears throat>
So I hope you come away with a feeling that... <laughs> so hopefully you 